there's not really anything that can be done about them. Um, because unlike a lot of the snakes, you know, none of these guys have got an antivenom or anything like that. If you were to be bitten by it, basically all you can do is treat the symptoms. You can't really treat the cause. Um, and, you know, in my experience with venom has been that, you know, most conventional painkillers do not really do too much. At minimum, it's going to be a painful experience. And then, you know, there is the potential that it could be worse than that, depending on what it was. The Cobra, man. I'm gonna blow Wildlife Command Center up with some free handling. Why don't you just the turtle? Turtle's super cute. Come on. Wow, you clicked through. Thanks for checking out this video. I'm Cole. I'm the Wildlife Command Center YouTuber and videographer in Michael's shadow for the last four months, and it's been a lot of fun bringing you guys new content for the channel. I am taking Michael's role of being the curator of this video for two reasons. One, he's not here right now, and two, he sent me down to Dallas, specifically the Dallas-Fort Worth area, to check in with Nick, our territory manager down there, and he has just the craziest collection of reptiles, insects, tarantulas, isopods, and a whole bunch of other names that I cannot pronounce. <laughs> I have filmed a lot of crazy things in my time, but watching Nick freehand a cobra and deal with so many different things that could bite and or sting him at any given moment is definitely towards the top of that crazy list, so I know you're gonna enjoy this video. I'm addicted now, guys. If you weren't aware, Michael is a rather busy guy, so from time to time, he'll be sending me on the road, linking up with many of our different technicians across the country bringing you guys live animal removals and all types of different stuff i'm sure it's going to get pretty crazy this year i'm really looking forward to working with michael and everyone else at the wildlife command center this year bringing you guys new content and i know it's going to be a wild ride so thanks for watching even break more tail feathers yeah this guy is not at all like rocky he's also not manned at all not not particularly friendly how long have you done falconry uh so i became a falconer december 2015 so i know i know i know so what you got here so this is a eastern great horned owl he's a male uh, does wow. not like your camera you're surprisingly not biting my finger, actually. So I've always liked raptors in general, um, you know, since I was a kid and I always had the desire to own them. Uh, but obviously, you know, unless it's an exotic, the only legal way to own a native raptor in the U.S. is, is to, to be a falconer, basically. Morally, I always felt it was kind of wrong to sort of just keep them in a cage. Um, and so really the only, like, ethical way to keep them if you're going to keep them uh would be falconry because at least they, they still get to do you know what they're naturally made to do just through the reptile keeping hobby there's a lot of overlap between you know falconers and and reptile keepers and you know when i was a kid i always just thought falconry was something for the history books i didn't realize that people still did it especially not in america i ended up making connections uh that led me to meeting michael and michael sponsored me and um there we go. Gave, gave me my chance. So, uh, mostly I'm gonna go after cottontail. Um, I mean, there are some people that have taken uh, squirrels and stuff with them, but, and they do, you know, they will take squirrels and stuff in the wild. I mean, from a hunting perspective, I think probably the, the best and easiest thing to go after with these guys would just be cottontails. Just being out there is fun enough, but it, it is always better when you're catching something more interesting than rats, uh, which is, what my experience had been mostly here hunting. Uh, a lot of the fields I tried to hit with the Harris Hawk, you know, we were just pulling out rabs, um, which is not really that exciting to me, but. <laughs> so why Harris Hawks? Is that the first bird you started out with? So the first bird I flew was a, a Eastern red tail that I trapped in Missouri. Um, this is basically just because Michael. Michael has a very strong preference for Harris Hawks because they're really easy birds. Uh, they're very personable. Uh, they're typically pretty easy to train. 
Uh, and you know the cool the coolest thing about them is the fact that they hunt in familiar groups in the wild and then you know people do it in, in falconry as well. It's never really been the typical super friendly uh, Harris hog like like most captive bred birds. I mean it tolerates people but it's it's not really like bring it to comic-con type bird <laughs> uh, i mean it's not gonna it's not gonna bother anyone really but it, it's just not really like friendly to people like a lot of captive bred harrises all are she's a great hunter though um but she's just not really like she's very aloof uh for a captive bred harris and what's her name uh satsuki a little bit over five years old you know you've got a couple of falconer friends or co-workers or something like that like this sort of situation um, you know, we can all have a Harris hawk and bring them all out together and, and hunt together instead of trying to hunt individual birds one at a time. Michael just likes them, you know, he has plenty of them. Uh, and the reason is mostly just because they're, they're a super easy bird uh, and you're gonna get a lot of reward from a little effort. So what would you call yourself, a hobbyist or? Uh, I mean, so I've got a, I've got a, another business that I started and I, you know, breed and so I'm not working or out looking for snakes and photographing them or something. This is usually what I'm doing is taking care of my animals. So most of the animals in here are tarantulas. Um, these are insects. So these are not adults yet, but these are assassin bugs. It's a species from Africa. And those are insects. And these are what again? So these are, what's the common name? Uh, twin spot assassin bug. Twin, yeah, twin spot assassin bug. They're from West Africa. You wanna watch them eat? They're very exciting. Oh, uh, yes, please. Wow. Yeah, they're very, very vicious predators. Hey, you let it go. Sorry, I scared you. It's a bunch of centipedes to from Arizona. Pretty common and those just walk around Arizona. Uh yeah, they're pretty common in Sonoran. So this is the largest largest centipede species in the United States. They can get I've ne I've never seen one that big, but they're supposedly able to get up to 8 inches. So this is the same thing, different subspecies, pretty common and around here you can find them here, you can find them in Oklahoma. A lot of people, a lot of Texans are probably uh, accustomed to these guys. Same thing, just different subspecies. Looks different. So, are these venomous or just weird? Yes, they are, yeah. And what's the stinging part? So, they, the you see right underneath the, the face there, they've got these modified legs uh, that that they use to inject venom. They almost look two-headed. Yeah, that's sort of the point. Uh, so, you know, this, they'll, and they'll like use these like that. They'll use these uh, modified legs here in the back to like sort of grab you uh, and distract your attention and make you think that that's, you know, that's their head and then they'll come around with their actual head and, and bite you. <clears throat> so I got this, got this guy from West Texas. So this is this is the, the same species as all as those other centipedes. It's just a different subspecies. Well, super quick. Um, yeah, when they're smaller, they're a lot more like finicky and running around and acting crazy. Um, but yeah, these these are all the, the same thing. They're just different subspecies, and this is just a specific locality that's found in the Davis Mountains. But it has this like cool pattern look to it. They're just super quick. And these are also in West Texas. These are the, this is what the ones outside of the mountains look like. It's like, hide me. But yeah, I've been bitten by this, this, and that one. And what's that experience <laughs> like? Uh, I actually got bit trying to catch them uh, because, you know, as you can see, they're pretty fast. They run around pretty quick and out there in West Texas, you know, most of it's just rock walls, and so if you if you lose them into the crack, then that's the end of it. And so you, you just gotta grab them. That was, it was smaller when it bit me. This one, uh, it hurt for maybe two or three hours, uh, which is pretty uneventful. But like, 
Is it comparable to like a wasp or what? Oh no! I mean, they've got very bad venom. Yeah, you guys, uh, you, you animal guys have a way of downplaying it always. Yeah, I mean, they've they've got bad venom, but it's just small. You know, had it been like you know like big like one of these, uh, you know, had an adult like a good sized adult, it would have been yeah, it would have been bad. There's not really anything that can be done about them. Um, because unlike a lot of the snakes, you know, none of these guys have got an antivenom or anything like that. Uh, and so if you were to be bitten by it, basically all you can do is treat the symptoms. You can't really treat the cause. Um, and you know, in my experience with venom has been that, you know, most conventional painkillers do not really do too much. At minimum, it's going to be a painful experience, and then you know there is the potential that it could be worse than that, depending on what it was. So we got some colorful tarantulas. And what what species is this? So common name is what Colombian giant bird eater, I think. Uh, so this is a species from Colombia. Pretty cool. Giant is sort of a a misnomer they really don't get that big uh i mean they can't get six you know six inch leg span seven inch leg span di like diagonal leg span so they do get bigger than this so invertebrates like this basically you know, tarantulas what they'll do is they'll like lay down a a mat of like of webbing uh to sort of deter ants and stuff like that from from coming around them when they're you know and soft and vulnerable and then They'll flip over on their back <clears throat> and that, that sort of center piece uh, in the body there that the legs are attached to, they, they bust out of it uh, and then, you know, come out of the mold like that and then sort of kick it off their, their new body. It takes a couple of days for them to harden up and then they flip back over and are back like to a, normal. Looks like a crab. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all like all invertebrates sort of go through the same process. It's a little bit, a little bit different, but you know, invertebrates have got an exoskeleton, and so they've got to, you know, shed the whole thing and and sort of remake themselves in a sense. I knew, I knew nothing about caring for any of these types of animals. Is that something you have to do? Like, do you clean out webbing and stuff, or like, do you leave it? Or? So this this species is like a big, 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 big time webber. Um, and so it's, you know, they just construct little houses out of web and uh, there's not really any reason to clean it out. They'll just keep doing it. You know, not all tarantulas are like that, but this species in particular is probably like one of the spiders known for being very heavy webbers. I mean, most, most tarantulas, depends on the species, but a lot of them are going to live at least 10 years. Uh, you know, and some of them can live 20, 30 years, you know, depending on the species. And do they need a mate to breed? <clears throat> they do, yeah. And so typically, you know, and I've, um, I'm actually going to be breeding her in the next couple of days. But the the males, you know, like a lot of the other a lot of, a lot of the other spiders, they're basically just there for breeding. Now most of them are either going to change colors, um, or you know, you're going to see you know diminished leg size, um, and then they'll get a lot of them will get hooks like on the, the end of their front legs that, that they use to pry the female up uh, and hold her in place when they breed her, you know, their front toes and it, it like <laughs> flips out and, and, and does an assertion. So this is, this is actually a male of that species. You know, the, you know, yeah, you're going to kick hairs of me. Uh, but the legs are going to be different. Stop. I don't want to deal with that. What's that going on? <clears throat> uh, so m a lot of new world species, uh, we'll kick hairs like that as a defense. Uh, that's sort of going to be their, their first line of defense. These hairs, uh, like you saw in the other spider, ha had that bald spot. Uh, they've got like a, a patch of hairs right there, and they'll use a, <clears throat> this uh, thing on their back leg, leg to like scratch it off. Deterrent for predators, uh, to tell them to leave them alone. Uh, a good way to think of it is like fiberglass. You know, it, it basically does this sort of thing. It's like a barbed hair. So if it gets on your skin, <clears throat> it gets embedded in the skin and you get a rash from it, it dishes. It's basically just like fiberglass insulation. Now, when we first walked in here, I noticed the difference in temperature. Is that something that you watch? Yeah, so I've got, uh, I mean, I've got these these ceramic uh, heaters here, but then I've got a like a Nest temp sensor. Uh, and, you know, I look at it on my phone. All, all my animal rooms have got these. 
uh, and I just monitor, you know, monitor, monitor the temperature um, to keep it, you know, at, at the right temperature. Uh, you know, whether it's cold outside or hot outside, there's gonna be some sort of fluctuation, and so I've got it set up to where it's gonna stay where I want it to stay. Um, you know, I normally keep it around 75. You know, this this heater is set at 75. Um, and so it, it goes up to 80 and turns off and then, you know, comes back on when it gets below 75. Are these uh, soy sauce uh, containers? <laughs> no. I mean, maybe. I mean, it's just a one ounce container from Amazon. Can I get five sauces to go, sir? Yeah. They're pretty cool. It's the fourth, fourth largest tarantula species in the world. These are? Yep. They're gonna, it's gonna get... These are just individual ones? Yeah. Yeah, this, this is... So these guys are... These are all tarantulas. They're probably... How old are you guys now? So they're, they're tiny now, but... They're, they're probably... I don't know, three months old, maybe? What does a tarantula run you on the market right now? So these guys uh, are probably one of the cheapest tarantulas. They're, they're fairly easy to breed, and then also they typically gonna have one to 2,000 babies in a sack. Holy uh, cow. And so they're very prolific. Uh, and so they're, you know, they're, they're cheap. But then some of these other ones, you know, I've got some that easily five, six hundred, and seven hundred dollar animals. You know, depending on what it is, the species, the rarity, uh, that sort of thing. It could, it could be from a couple of dollars to a few hundred dollars. Some of them possibly even up over a thousand dollars. Where are we now? Uh, so this is where I keep all my isopods and springtails and some roaches. I'm excited to find out what an isopod is. So isopods are well, I guess not all of them are terrestrial. So these are terrestrial isopods. They're, you know, a small, small little crustacean. Plenty of people find them in their backyard, you know, call them roly polies, pill bugs. Was there like a queen that gets larger? So the, the males, so you can see uh, like this. So this is, the males has got extra long uropods. That's what these, mm -hmm. that's what this tail thing is. Uh, this is their sexual organs, and so when they're mature, the males can have like super long ones. Most of these guys do not have common names, and so this species is called Porcelio magnificus. I'm gonna call it Carl. And so uh, one of one of the largest species known to science, and so this is probably the largest species really that's kept in the hobby. There's a bigger species from Asia that that is not really like a colony type animal, they live in pairs, um, and people don't really keep them in in captivity, but this is probably the largest, on average, uh, species kept in, in captivity. 20 years ago, uh, I suppose the big thing was really, you know, there was a couple, a handful of species that people kept, and it was really like for dart frog keepers. You know, they would use it for food for the froglets. They would use it for cleanup crew for the tank. Uh, and then also it's going to help enrich the, the soil and stuff like that for the plants. You know, breaking down the leaf litter and, and eating any poop and stuff like that. And so that was really the big thing. This species is really sort of what sort of tipped it over 2017. This is an undescribed species from Thailand. Uh, you know, a lot of people know them as rubber ducky isopods. Uh, and these guys are really what, what really sent it over the edge. So is that its ass end or its face end? So, yeah, so this is the face. You can see the little eyes. Yeah, I guess I see the rubber ducky part. It's got like almost an orange bill. Yeah, exactly. I got isopods specifically as a, uh, to use as cleanup crew for some of my reptiles. I mean, that was really what got me into it and then this is this is really where it started you know my my whole buddha bugs business thing was really um it started with the isopods and then um i'd always kept tarantulas tarantulas is something i've been keeping for a long time uh but i'd never really bred any i sort of just you know at my most i had had like 70 or something at one point uh and they were just pets uh and now i've got like almost 500 um, <clears throat> with probably more on the way. For a long time, I was basically just a venomous snake guy. You know, I had 120, 130 venomous snakes, and that was my big thing. And then when I met her, <clears throat> uh, my wife, she's Chinese, she's from China, and 
uh, and I was traveling to Asia a lot and I didn't have anyone that I could trust uh, to take care of my, you know, my venomous snakes um, that I felt could do it safely and, and not be a liability for everyone. Uh, and so I had to, and ended up getting rid of basically all of them. Um, and, you know, two years ago, I was <clears throat> pretty much down to a handful of snakes, a handful of tarantulas, and I was pretty much done keeping animals, really. Um, and then it just, it just blew back up, and now I'm in it deep, super, <laughs> super deep again. Usually the, the big hang-up is going to be moisture requirements. You know, since, they, since they are crustaceans, they do have gills. They do need moisture to, to breathe. Uh, and so depending on the species, some of them require higher moisture, some of them require lower moisture, some of them need more ventilation, less ventilation. Uh, and that's why you can see like my, my cages are set up in different ways with more or less ventilation. So all these guys have gills? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's just like a fish. That's weird. Yeah, and, there, and, that's, and that's why, and, there, and so there are some species that can survive in like incredibly dry temperatures uh, or dry environments, which is interesting for an animal that needs you know moisture in the air to breathe got a couple things we got chinese cobra here that needs to be cleaned come here relax Whew. yeah so i mean i still do have a couple venomous snakes but like i said i pretty much have gotten gotten away from keeping the venomous um, in favor of, wow, sorry, buddy, uh, in favor of keeping invertebrates instead. Can you relax? I mean, I'm familiar with the cobras. Is there specific identifying factors with the Chinese cobra? So, I mean, as a, as a whole, the, these guys are typically black. Most of them are going to have this banding like this. And then they've got, their hood pattern is typically pretty unique a lot of times they're gonna have this sort of monocle hood with the like wings yeah um i mean not all of them have that but it's pretty standard look for for that species uh and these are probably probably one of my favorite species of cobra which is why i got another one after i've gotten rid of all my venomous uh, i just like the way they look um, you know, some are nicer than others. I wish this one had more of a, a clean banding pattern on it, but as a whole, I think it's a pretty, pretty good looking animal. So are you more or less self-taught or? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, when I was, a, I spent a lot of time like looking for snakes in the wild and, and photographing them and stuff. That's probably my favorite thing to do. Uh, and when I was a kid, I used to. I used to catch snakes and stuff and keep them and uh, and so yeah I mean most of my uh, experience at least when I was younger was just finding wild animals and and dealing with them but yeah no I'm complete I mean I went to school for wildlife conservation and I did um, you know sort of specialize on snakes uh, as most as I, you know, as, as best as I could for a university that doesn't, you know, doesn't have a herpetology program. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, as a, as far as keeping them and interacting with them and in a non-academic sense, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much completely self-taught. This guy seems pretty active. Yeah, yeah, most, most of these, uh, most of this family which is called a lapids. They they tend to be pretty movy um, compared to a lot of different snakes. They definitely are always trying to move. Just haven't been able to set it up lately. You're fine, Jesus. I know. Do that, please.
My bad. Move. Can, can you move, please? I oh, know. Go, go in there. Okay. Whatever. Bye. That guy stands in pretty stark contrast to something like this. So this is a puff adder. And these guys are ambush predators and pretty much spend their whole life sitting in one place. Um, and doesn't really, he doesn't really move. You're in shed. So it's normally way prettier than that, but he's actually in shed. Usually there's a lot of like red and orange and yellow highlights and stuff that are in them. But, so yeah, see, and this is why they're called puff adders. And they like to do this thing where they, you know, fill their body with air like that and then very noisily exhale it. You know, there's a lot of different snake bite statistics around the world, particularly in the third world, because there's, there's not a lot of medical records. Uh, a lot of people would tend to choose traditional medicine over Western medicine. And so there's, the stats are kind of skewed, but <clears throat> depending on who you ask, these guys are uh, the most lethal snake in Africa. Uh, they cause the highest number of deaths or otherwise morbidity. Uh, very common for field workers and stuff to lose their leg or something like that. Uh, they've got a, a very, very bad venom. Komodo Island Blue Pit Viper. Uh, they're found on a couple of other islands besides Komodo Island, but uh, this color form is uh, probably my favorite. They come in an all yellow too, uh, and then they have like just a, like a leaf green kind of color too, but always like I really like blue animals and so this is a species that I'd always wanted for a long time and where are these native of Indonesia a couple islands uh, the species as a whole is found throughout the whole entire Indonesian archipelago but uh, this this color form is found in Komodo and um, a couple of the other islands but Komodo is probably the most famous island that they're known from and what one is this again? Uh, so this is a gray banded king snake you know it's probably it's probably like the jewel of most Americans you know a lot of people go out to West Texas specifically, specifically looking to find this species in the wild most of the king snakes including this one have got some level of immunity to most of the native uh, pit viper species in the United States and so they'll eat venomous snakes and, and not be even if they get bit by them not you know not be bad off or any worse for it so this is probably my favorite snake that I have that is intimidating so it will be these guys go through a very dramatic color change as they grow up um, I mean, as she gets older, she, that blue is going to be a lot more apparent. Um, and it's going to start spreading across the body and get some blue, a lot more blue in the face and stuff. Wow, that, that is crazy. So these guys, like, uh, as far as, like, snakes are concerned, this genus in particular is probably, like, the most extreme example of sexual dimorphism in snakes. And so this is, she's immature now. Uh, but as, you know, when, once she's mature, she's going to be... A, decent size bigger than that uh and you know like i said she's gonna have a lot of blue and stuff like that whereas the males um are gonna be smaller than that snake was so the first famous snake i had was probably a copperhead uh, when i was a kid i caught a couple of northern copperheads in my yard and, and kept them for a little bit and uh, i didn't start like really actually keeping stuff like all the time until about about nine years ago uh, is when I really started keeping exotic venomous and, uh, and always having a snake. Whew. So this is a Mexican hog nose. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so these guys are, I mean, basically it's pretty much the same. It's a different species. They look slightly different, but um, haven't got him to play dead for me in a while, but he does like putting on this little display. And the funny thing is, is uh, one of the common names in America for these guys is also a puff adder like that other snake because they have that same sort of behavior where they, uh, you know, 
suck in air and then forcefully exhale it and make that huffing noise. They're they're not typically considered medically significant. They are technically by definition venomous. Uh, and there are definitely a handful of people, not of this particular species, but just hog noses in general, there are a handful of people in the medical li literature that have had pretty severe reactions uh, to bites from them. But as, as a general rule, they don't really pose really any risk. I've been bitten by them plenty of times, not this particular animal. It's never tried to bite or do anything other than sort of bluff. Uh, but I have been bitten by large adult Easterns when I lived in Virginia. And I mean, it, I never really had anything beyond just, you know, the same typical mild swelling you would have from a bite from any, any other snake. A couple other states and Mexico as well, but it's another one of those snakes like the gray banded that a lot of people will travel to go find in the wild for obvious reasons. They're, you know, they're pretty nice colorful snakes. It's a Transpecos rat snake. They're found in a small, re ah, small region uh, in the Transpecos, Chihuahua Desert, West Texas. New Mexico, Mexico, same sort of, same sort of thing. These guys live side by side, these other two. Who are you The Cobra, man. I'm gonna blow Wildlife Command Center up with some free hand. Well, why don't you just hold this one? So is this like a smaller species of Cobra? No, this is just a young animal. Gotcha. It's gonna get a couple, uh, so these guys get about five foot, pretty pretty average size for them. They're not like super large, but pretty pretty normal average size. Oh no, yeah no, it's it's a lot bigger than it was when I got it. I got it. Mm, September 2020 so it's it's probably it's it's maybe like I think it was a couple months old when I got it so it's it's maybe like close to a year and a half old but yeah it's gonna it's gonna get a lot bigger thanks for letting me check out your weird stuff welcome <laughs> well I will link Buddha bugs down along with your socials in the description Appreciate it. Tom. And it's your job to tell everyone thanks for watching and make sure they subscribe. Thanks for watching. And? And make sure you subscribe. Perfect. Thanks, Nick. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Say hi, Anthony. What's up? What's your official position here? I'm an animal care technician. How long have you been here now? I've been here since like the end of November. Anthony's been great. Shout out to you. High five. Tell people to uh, subscribe. Subscribe. Thanks for watching. Big shout out to Nick again. It was awesome exploring his ridiculous animal collection. And uh, thanks for being here. See you next time.